Welcome to the Daughter Rise channel. My name is Yvonne and this channel is all about bringing you content to do with childhood sexual abuse. On this channel I share things to do with my experience of going through this childhood trauma. I share my experience of going through challenging things, things that empowered or helped me to come through the other side. Also as well I share news stories and add my thoughts and commentary to them. And from time to time, unfortunately enough, I do interview other survivors and their supporters in hopes of raising awareness of this childhood trauma. So if this is the type of content you're looking for, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you can be notified of any new uploads. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up if you like the content. So in today's video, guys, I wanted to do a sit down video to talk to you about broken relationships. Now, this is something I don't really see a lot of people talk about when it comes to a victim or survivor's experience of childhood sexual abuse and even with victims and survivors of this childhood trauma it's something that is almost secondary in the things that they talk about quite rightly because for a lot of victims and survivors the first thing they're trying to battle with every day is coping with their experience of going through childhood sexual abuse for many survivors it's affected them psychologically some survivors are battling secondary, you know, um, physical symptoms caused by the trauma of childhood sexual abuse. You know, there are so many things going on for somebody who has gone through that type of trauma. And I have found in talking to other survivors, especially through the work I do with my organisation Daughter Rise, which I have founded now 12 years ago, that it does certainly seem to be the case. And I want to share with you a little bit of my experience about broken relationships from my experience of going through childhood sexual abuse and really just kind of really highlight some points about, you know, how to deal with that really. When I disclosed my childhood sexual abuse, I was 13 years old and I disclosed it to a friend at the time that I had. And when I was disclosing that to my friend, I didn't really think anything about the implications of doing that I just decided to tell her because obviously I had found out this information some days earlier from um, Childline when they came to my secondary school you know, I've shared in my book Daughter Arise about how when Childline came to my school it was the first time in five years I had a name for what my dad was doing to me and I was just sharing that information with my friend this newfound information that I had that this is exactly what I was going through at home but I didn't really think she was going to do anything with that information. I was just sharing it. But, you know, lo and behold, a few days later, social services and the police turned up at my house. Um, the police had a warrant because my dad had tied me to a chair. And they had a war warrant for the kettle flex because that is something I disclosed to my friend. And also social services came because my friend had told her mum and her mum told the head of her secondary school that I was being sexually abused. So the social workers and the police had come to basically, you know, take me into care. So I was just caught up in that moment of disclosing and wanting to share with somebody my experience. But I didn't foresee all this that was going to happen afterwards. And another thing I definitely didn't think about even after that when I was taken into foster care and taken into the care system where I remained until I was like 17 and a half was the impact it would have on my relationships with my family. Now, right from the beginning, there was tension with my family, um, especially my parents. And when my parents were questioned by social services, you know, my mum said I was a drama queen and I was making it up. And my dad was flat out denying that he sexually abused me. And that right there was where the divide started because obviously I know what I went through at the hands of my dad what he did to me, how it affected my life, and the realisation of how my disclosure was going to affect my life was when I realised that my mum would not even consider the possibility that I had gone through this and she didn't believe me. And the fact that now my brother and sister were caught up in the mix as well because of the fact that I'm now in care and they are still living in the home. So already the relationships were starting to be broken. When I was in different kids' homes and stuff, you know, I couldn't get to, you know, have the relationship that I 
once had with my brother and sister because I was now living in care. Contact would be, if I was lucky, maybe once a month. But it wasn't like that at the beginning because my dad refused to let my brother and sister see me. And then when the social workers would try to arrange contact, especially my dad would make visitation very, very difficult and hard. So I wasn't able to have the same relationship that I had with my brother and sister for the 13 years that we were together living in the home. I didn't see my mum often and I def definitely didn't have a relationship with my dad anymore. And I'd like to tell you that, you know, even after I left the care system that my relationships with my birth family were healed, but that certainly wasn't the case because as I started to get a bit older, I wanted answers. I wanted to talk to my mum about what had happened to me and she basically didn't want to talk about it. And then there was a point where I kind of forced the question and how that came about was when I was around 21, I went to the house and back to the house I left when I was 13 because they were still living there and confronted my dad about what he did to me and he flat out denied it. And, you know, a few days later I met up with my mommy and mum and I said to her, now that I've, I've done that, now do you believe me? Because that was the carrot that she always dangled in front of my nose. Well, if you did it, why have you never said anything? So I took her up on that challenge when I was 21. And when I said that to her, she just said to me, oh, Yvonne, just forget about it. From that day when she said that to me, I decided I didn't want a relationship with her anymore. And it was painful to come to the realisation that the relationships that I had with the non-abusing members of my family, my mum, my brother and sister, were never going to be the same anymore. Again, you know, my brother and sister tried to maintain relationships with them for a certain amount of years, but I don't have a relationship with them anymore. And it's been for a number of reasons, but really, you know, the early kind of emotional connections and closeness that we had that was starting to be formed when I was in the home for those for those 13 years where we were living as siblings was, was not strong enough to keep lifelong relationships with them and it was very painful and it was very hard to realize that the casualties of me speaking out about my experience the casualty of me freeing myself from my dad's abuse would be the loss of these relationships it was very difficult for me to get my head around and I had to go through a season of grieving for those relationships and for a long time, especially I think in my teenage years and up until my mid-twenties, I felt a lot of guilt and a lot of burden, probably up until that age about 23, 24, about how my disclosure of abuse affected my family and how it ruined my relationships with you know, especially my brother and sister. But I had to go through a lot of soul searching and, you know, therapy to rid myself of those feelings and, you know, come to the realisation that my survival, my self-preservation was more important than these relationships. Because I had seen already when I had my nervous breakdown in my early 20s, when I was in a mental health clinic for a number of months and we used to have support group in there, I had already seen women who had never spoken up about their experience of going through sexual abuse. I remember there was a black woman in the same time as me when I was in the clinic and she came from an African background and had never had the courage to speak up and tell anybody what her dad was doing to her. And he ended up getting her pregnant. And when I thought about and reflected on hearing her experiences of going through that and the outcome of that and thought about how I had the courage to speak up and how it broke so many relationships, I realised that I had made the right choice. Self-preservation, healing, 
you know, combating my mental health issues was the most important thing. And if that meant that those relationships had to suffer because of that, then so be it. I had to learn to live with it. I did wish it could be another way, but it is what it is. And that is the hand of things that I was dealt and I had to deal with it. And, go, and as a survivor who had spoken out about my experience and, you know, at the time just wanted to free myself and have my voice be heard and not realising that the aftermath would be these broken relationships, I had to learn to deal with a lot of loneliness. Loneliness was something that would be part of my life for a long time, especially when I left the care system at 17 and a half. I was aged out by social services. I was given my first flat. At that point, my mum was in my life a little bit. She'd come up every other weekend and bring me up shopping and things like that and I was really grateful for that from her and this was before 21 you know when I finally confronted her and my dad when I went to the house I saw my brother and sister sometimes and I filled my time with unhealthy relationships you know I was young I I couldn't discern people I wasn't wise and also I should say here as well with my grand my nan my mum's mum I mean, it was her house that was kind of the facilitation pad for my abuse because my dad had an office over there and um, she didn't believe me either. But that's another thing because relationships were broken. I hadn't seen her for a number of years. And then just on the off chance, and I've mentioned this in another video, I found out in 2016, you know, that she died my gran and even though she may not have done the right thing by me i still had many good memories attached to her at the time i was part of my family unit my birth family unit you know her house during the 80s for me had so many good memories of times we used to go over there me and my brother and sister and you know and annoy her and stuff you know but that's another kind of consequence of speaking out that i found that, you know, somebody who I loved passed and I couldn't even get to say goodbye. But even with all those things and when those memories and feelings come up, I still stand by my decision to speak out. So that really was my experience of broken relationships. I have no relationships with my birth family now. And it will only be by the grace of God that that happens. But I do pray for my mum and I do pray for my brother and sister. I believe my dad has passed away. I don't know what your experience of broken relationships is. As I mentioned, other survivors that I work with over the years have said similar things to me. They were just trying to deal with their experience, but in dealing with their experience and disclosing, it caused all kinds of things to happen. You would have uh, survivors who disclosed and were then kind of had this kind of pressure put on them to recant and to you know take back what they said you have other survivors whose family cut them off or you have survivors who cut their family off so many different scenarios that have been caused by childhood sexual abuse you know, that I've contributed to broken relationships. But it's one of the things that happens, I'm afraid. And um, it's something that you have to deal with if you want to heal from your sexual abuse or be able to move forward from it. Because as I've mentioned on other videos, to deny your experience is a travesty to yourself. No matter what the cost is, if it's broken relationships and stuff, you know, to deny it and to suppress and say that it never happened to you to, to save something else rather than saving you only damages you in the long run. But there are things that you can do to help with broken relationships, you know, if you're experiencing it. One is to be able to find a good support group that will, will support and encourage you or an organisation to support and encourage you. Like to arise. not saying you have to the organisation that I founded, but an organisation that provides peer empowerment, a community of people who've gone through the same experience as you, 
to support during the hard times, a place where you can come and get encouragement and get support through the things that you're facing. Um, also as well, you can go to therapy to help deal with the broken relationships because understanding that, because you know, for some survivors it's shocking that they've tried to tell the truth about something that happened to them that has affected their life, yet they are experiencing pe people in their family that are turning against them or disowning them or that relationships just change because they've told somebody, you know. It's very difficult to deal with and difficult to understand and it's something that I went through. So therapy is something that can help you with that, to unpack that and maybe get some kind of insight into why that is. Also as well, if you have within your family social circle people who are not going to disown you because you've told your story or shared that you've gone through abuse, finding and seeking out those members of your family, maybe extended family like cousins or friends that can be a support to you, you know, is going to help as well. And last but not least, I should say it's the most important one for me, I should say, especially, is seeking God when you have experienced broken relationships. One of the Bible scriptures that the Lord gave me, and I will leave it here, is that even though your mother and father forsake you, I will never leave you. And for me, Jesus has kept true to his word. All those years in between, before I got married, because I got married in 2005, from 1990, from 1988, to 2005 unknowingly the Lord had been keeping me and had been my comfort and I realized that when I became a born again Christian at 21 years old that the Lord had been with me in my darkest times and had carried me through and he has been my mother and my father he has been all that I need even now he is all that I need he is the one that gives relationship unconditionally love unconditionally, healing unconditionally. So I would encourage you, if you can, to just open your heart and just speak to God like you speak to a friend and just talk, explain to him how the broken relationships have affected you, cry to him. You know, you don't have to go necessarily to kneel on your knees to go before God. He wants you to come as you are and he will help you and point you in the right direction to navigate through the broken relationships that you are experiencing in your life. So guys, that is it for this video. I hope that you have found what I've shared in this video to be something that can help you through your situation if you're experiencing this. I will leave links to my book, my autobiography, Daughter Arise, in the description box below. Also Choose Life, which is a practical empowerment workbook to help survivors who have gone through childhood sexual abuse. You can see the books here in the background. Well, two of my five books in the background, the two that I'm talking to you about now. But I will see you on another video. Take care.